Hello, everyone. This is Stone Gas Man, live from New York City. And today we are going to be doing episode three of 60 Minutes of Stone for the uh, Visited by Voices Network. Uh, thank you for all for joining me today. And uh, we are going to be looking at the cinema of director Kat Shea. And uh, she uh, has uh, quite a unique resume that I really wanted to do a deep dive on. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm absolutely looking forward to doing this because there's a lot to talk about. And because with maybe one or two slight exceptions, I like almost everything that she ever did in terms of directing. So uh, why don't we go ahead and get started? Well, uh, so Kat Shea, uh, you know, she um, arrived in uh, L.A. Uh, uh, very, very early. She had graduated college early, and uh, she had uh, uh, put on uh, plays when she was a child, and she used to charge admission when she would do plays and, like, shoot movies and stuff and everything. And so when she got out to L.A., you know, and, and she, you know, she would get, you know, she would dabble a little bit in, in the... Uh, in the uh, low-budget film scene. Now, I'm, uh, and uh, while she had a string of acting roles in the 1980s, uh, my focus is not on those films, so I'm not going to really mention all of them. And as a matter of fact, I mean, one of her commentaries, you know, she even actively avoids trying to uh, mention them. Not, not necessarily because they're embarrassing. I mean, if you want to... Uh, look up all her acting roles. They're all listed on IMDb. But uh, because of the fact that she has uh, decided not to mention them in, in her other commentaries, I don't want to mention them as well. Uh, but with only a few exceptions. Now, she made her film debut in uh, 1983 uh, with one film for uh, Crown Films International, but uh, the uh, big break that she had was also with director Brian De Palma for the 1983 version of Scarface, uh, which, of course, uh, you know, stars Al Pacino, stars as Tony Montana, who comes from Cuba, uh, com uh, who comes from Cuba and, and goes to Florida and amasses this, you know, this cocaine empire uh, you know it's you know it's a very famous film it's considered one of the great uh gangster classics and uh and it's also considered uh, you know one of brian de palma's best films to be perfectly honest and um uh me personally i'm a purist when it comes to uh not always i mean uh, you know like i said i mean when it comes to like you know horror film remakes like especially like the thing which is based on an old Howard Hawks movie or uh, The Fly or The Blob or something like that. Usually, not always, but usually I actually side with the remake because I do think that with, uh, you know, a better budget and uh, uh, more uh, the special effects being upgraded and everything, and also, you know, the chance to have uh, more realistic dives into the story using updated effects – I think they actually, most part, turn out to be better films. Scarface, my heart is with the 1932 original. And just largely for the fact that when, you know, whenever somebody talks about the 1983 film, the 32 film is either barely mentioned or never mentioned. I mean, on the uh, documentary by the great Laurent Bouzereau on uh, the Scarface Blu-ray, it's not mentioned once. It's not even acknowledged once. And, you know, but here again, the, the 83 Scarface, you know, it, I, I enjoy it for its look at early 1980s Miami. You know, it's very Grand Theft Auto, Vice City, you know, very comfortable, but also a little campy. And I, the one thing that's always bothered me about Scarface 83 is that Pacino's accent is so over the top, it's laughable. You know, it's a small point. You know, I, I, I don't think the 83 film is a masterpiece like the 32 film, but I've but over the years I've come around on Scarface 1983. Uh, but it's not one of my favorite uh, De Palmas, to be perfectly honest. But uh, Cat Shea uh, was definitely inspired by De Palma 
and you know many of his uh, uh, films that he directed, you know, like uh, uh, the Phantom of the Paradise, and then Carrie, and then ultimately to one of my personal favorites was which is uh, Dress to Kill, which I have on uh, Criterion there on the shelf. And of course, you know, he would later do Blowout and Body Double, you know, and other movies like that. Well, actually, on a side note, uh, some of my favorite Brian De Palma movies are actually the black comedies that he made with Robert De Niro back in the early 70s, like Greetings and uh, High Mom. Um, but I still have yet to see Phantom of the Paradise. It's the 50th anniversary of that, so I need to check that out soon. But uh, so, yeah, she was very briefly in the nightclub sequence in Scarface. I think it's like an hour in uh, when, uh, you know, there's a massive shoot em up. It's the famous scene with, uh, 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 where, um, uh, let me introduce you to my little friend. You know, it's that sequence right there. And she's actually in that. Now, eventually she made her way to... Uh, the offices of Roger Corman, the very late Roger Corman, who uh, very sadly recently passed away at the age of 98. And even though I don't have any, uh, you know, I don't have like a, a sweatshirt or a shirt, you know, honoring uh, his co uh, Concord company, uh, I do have one for New World Pictures, which, of course, was also a Roger Corman company where he uh, distributed uh, low budget films and everything. And I know I shouldn't be wearing this in the, you know, you know, in the, when it's like 85 degrees right now, but I wanted to honor Roger Corman. So I'm going to sweat it out through this review uh, just to honor Roger Corman <laughs> while we talk about the, uh, the films that Cat Shea directed for Corman. Now, Right before uh, she had starred in a film for Roger Corman that I'm not going to go into, although I will say that um, while I never saw that particular film growing up, I had seen uh, the sequel, which was, and, it, you know, these are like, you know, uh, you know, fantasy films, you know, and they have a, a you know, a great amount of, uh, you know, sexual material and everything i mean very inappropriate films and they're and they were basically like roger corman's low budget answer to like conan the barbarian and all these fantasy films that came out in the early 80s but uh the acting role and in ironically it was pretty much her last acting role although she has appeared in a couple of her films in uh cameos um the film that I don't want to. I want to. I don't want to say necessarily put her on the map, uh, but here again, it was the last acting role that she essentially did, and that and that was for director Anthony Perkins for Psycho Three. I had talked about Psycho Two for episode uh, two of Sixty Minutes of Stone uh, because of the fact that was a Richard Franklin retrospective, and I did a, a deep dive on that as well his as well as his. Uh, three other Hitchcock, uh, Hitchcockian thrillers, which include Patrick, Road Games, and Cloak and Dagger, along with Psycho 2. Now, Psycho 3, which I'm only going to talk about very briefly, I actually really enjoy Psycho 3. I mean, it's very, very different from uh, the first two films. <clears throat> there is some continuity between 2 and 3, which I think fran franchise films appreciate. Although director Anthony Perkins was going for something completely different here. He wanted to honor Hitchcock in his own way. And, you know, he's inspired a little bit by Giallo films, but also most notably the uh, Coen brothers, uh, the Coen brothers movies from 1984 called blood simple, uh, which is a, a, a great, great first film for the Coen brothers, um, a great training ground for them as well. And um, uh, Anthony Perkins had actually shown that movie to his entire crew to prepare them for, you know, the, the tone that he was going for. But also, there was also an increase in, in the amount of dark comedy associated in Psycho 3. I mean, one of my favorite bits is when he's uh, stuffing his birds with the sawdust and everything. And using the same spoon, he decides to dip it in peanut butter and put it on a cracker and puts it in his mouth. I mean, that's a very, very Norman Bates thing to do, which I actually appreciate it. And I love Jeff Fahey's 
role in there is just a, an absolute nutcase. <laughs> He's just, I mean, he is a, a psychotic nut bar in this movie for the most part. And I think in many ways he kind of steals the film. But it's Cat Shea who also has a very, very memorable role. And the weird thing is, is that the very first time I saw the movie, of course, I had no idea who Cat Shea was. No idea whatsoever. I had not seen any of her films, with the exception of one, and I had completely forgotten about that. We'll get to that later. But uh, basically, she arrives with a bunch of... Uh, party goers. I don't know if they're celebrating homecoming, you know, the football players or whatnot. And uh, she ends up being murdered by mother while she's sitting on the toilet. Uh, but the interesting thing is that that's not the last we see of her. Uh, there are several shots throughout the last half hour of the movie, which are so memorable because of Cache. Uh, basically playing dead, okay? There's a, a wonderful shot of Anthony Perkins when he chucks her body out the window and, and you know, she ends up on the ground and we just see like half of her face completely frozen, you know, in terms of death and everything. Awesome. Uh, there's a scene where he picks her up and starts carrying her around, completely supports the character of Norman Bates Anthony Perkins kind of falls in love with Cat Shea while she is basically uh, acting and pretending to be dead. And the, the best scene, there, there's a, a perfect scene here again that, you know, very much inspired by the Coen brothers in, in that um, <laughs> Cat Shea basically ends up in the icebox next to the motel. Now, there is an interview with Cat Shea on this Blu-ray, as you can see right there. I mean, uh, yeah, there's an audio commentary with the screenwriter, Charles Edward Pogue, but there's also an interview with uh, Kat Shea, as well as the makeup effects artist, Michael Westmore. I'm trying to get, yeah, I'm trying to get this in, in focus here, and I'm having difficulty doing it, but uh, at any rate, okay, so there's about a 10-minute interview with Kat Shea on here. Wonderful, wonderful interview. And, um, and and she talks about how, like, at the time that she didn't really appreciate uh, doing it. But now, of course, you know, she looks back with nothing but reverence. And, uh, and, and, and like I said, I mean, she has a very, very memorable role. And here again, I mean, in retrospect, I can actually understand after doing a role like that, you know what, I'm done with acting. Let me try something else. So she convinces Roger Corman to get into directing along with her um, writing partner and, and, uh, ex-husband, uh, Andy Rubin, who unfortunately has also passed away since then. And, uh, they had written a screenplay called, uh, together called The Patriots for, uh, Crown Films International. Now, I'm not gonna really mention anything about The Patriot, even though I did watch it prior to doing this, uh, uh, episode, the only thing I can say about the Patriot is that it's um, it's way better than the Mel Gibson version. Yeah, it's and uh, speaking as somebody uh, who actually served in the United States Navy, because it you know it it basically involves like a Navy captain and everything. It here again, it's a hell of a lot more watchable than the Mel Gibson version. A hell of a lot more watchable. And I have a direct ancestor who fought in uh, the Revolutionary War under George Washington's command. Trust me, watch the 1986 Patriot over the Mel Gibson Patriot. It's super low budget, but, uh, you know, I think it's certainly a lot uh, much more worth your time. I mean, particularly when you uh, consider the fact it's virtually half the running time of the Mel Gibson Patriot. <clears throat> but uh, she and her partner, Andy Rubin, managed to convince uh, the late Roger Corman uh, to direct uh, herself, and the first script that they collaborated on, which ultimately became this, uh, sort of like this Brian De Palma homage in many ways. He, she wanted to honor De Palma in her own way, sort of like how De Palma honored Hitchcock, along with Anthony Perkins to a certain extent with Psycho 
3, and of course with Richard Franklin in Psycho 2. But she wanted to honor Brian De Palma, so she made Stripped to Kill. Yes, the 1987 film Stripped to Kill from Corman's Concord Company. And uh, I, I, I really love the tagline that's right here is, a maniac is killing strippers. Detective Cody has only one weapon to stop him. Her body. Yes. So, yeah, Strip to Kill. It's basically about a strip club called Rock Bottom, uh, which operates in L.A. And it's run by uh, Norman Fell, of all people, Mr. Roper from, uh, uh, from the series Three's Company, which I actually think is one of the funniest sitcoms uh, in the history of television. But uh, Kay Lenz plays a police detective, and uh, her partner, played by Greg Evigan, who uh, they're basically uh, working undercover together. When they, when they get wind of the fact that there's the serial killer basically killing these strippers, uh, they decide to go undercover, which includes Kay Lenz basically... Uh, going in as a stripper and basically she convinces Norman Fell after you know after an audition and everything that uh, you know to become a stripper she gets to know her you know her 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 co-workers and everything and she tries to solve the mystery as to who exactly is doing it is it a customer is it somebody on the outside I mean we don't know we have no idea and that's what of course Kay Lenz sets out to try to find out. And um, Strip to Kill is, even though it's ostensi ostensibly a sexploitation thriller, it's actually, I mean, considering the fact that Cat Shea was one of the precious few women directors to emerge in the 1980s. I mean, yeah, I mean, we had Susan Seidelman, you know, we had... Um, several other women directors at the time, but you know, they really were an endangered species. And uh, so, and of course, you know, just real quick, I mean, when it comes to women directors, you know, back in the silent era, we had uh, Lois Weber, who I'd like to give credit as directing the very first horror film, which is this 1913 movie called Suspense. Uh, but before her, we had Alice Guy Blaché, who was uh, a French uh, uh, director who directed in uh, 1896, The Cabbage Fairy. Now, after Lois Weber and Alice Guy Blanche, we, Blaché, we only had two female directors in the golden age of films in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, we had Dorothy Arzner, who directed several studio films, although the interesting thing, thing about Dorothy Arzner, she had to... Just, uh, basically dress and act like a man. So she actually wore men's clothes. She wore suits and everything. And uh, she's very famous for directing uh, Dance Girl Dance, which has like this uh, feminist monologue delivered by um, Maureen O'Hara near the end. Good, good stuff. And then, of course, we had Ida Lupino, who, made, who was an actress who made socially conscious films in the late 40s, early 50s. You know, she made a movie um, about uh, rape called Outrage. And she also made a movie uh, about bigamy called uh, The Bigamist. And, you know, and her most famous film is this brilliant, brilliant noir called uh, The Hitchhiker. You know, uh, just to give you an idea of some of the earliest women directors. And then, of course, in 1971... Uh, we also had another director, Stephanie Rothman, who also worked for Roger Corman, and she directed uh, The Velvet Vampire. Now, I didn't, I, I didn't get a chance to dig it out here, but I do have a very rare copy of The Velvet Vampire. Actually, it's right here. I'll go ahead and show you. This is long out of print. But yeah, this is a, a great little film that was produced by Roger Corman back in the early 70s and directed by Stephanie Rothman. And so, like I said, women directors were just, you know, few and far between. I mean, you know, they, they really largely worked in independent films. And very, very rarely did we see a woman take on major studio films. Now, Cat Shea, 
even though this movie was made for Corman with the idea that it was going to sell to a certain market, a certain audience, you know, it had to have a requisite amount of nudity and it had to have a, rec- a requisite amount of violence according to what Corman wanted. But the flip side, the catch was, is that he basically did give his filmmakers autonomy to do whatever they wanted as long as those requisites were there. In fact, according to Cat Shea, he kind of encouraged that. So Strip to Kill, while it is ostensibly a sexploitation picture, Cat Shea and Andy Rubin give it a striking amount of class, humor, and sophistication. Okay. This film has a real sense of humor going throughout it. And there, and you know, some of the murders are very much uh, inspired by De Palma. I mean, Strip to Kill, I mean, it's an, you know, the title alone is a, is an obvious homage to uh, Dress to Kill, which, like I said, I got up there on Criterion. And I thoroughly enjoy Strip to Kill. I mean, you know, it's 88 minutes. It's a, a, a terrific exercise in low-budget genre filmmaking that here, again, is definitely uh, a cut above many other films that came out about that time that had the same um, target audiences and the same intentions as to what they were selling to that audience. But it's actually, you know, it's actually more than watchable in terms of uh, all the elements that it has. The performances are very good, particularly from uh, Kay Lenz, Greg Evigan, and um, uh, Norman Fell, as, like I said, the, uh, <laughs> the the operator of the strip club called Rock Bottom. <laughs> it's just glorious. It's just absolutely glorious. Now, this uh, Blu-ray from Scorpion is now long out of print, I know that Strip to Kill was re-released with another film. I don't remember, and I don't remember if it is out of print. But you can watch Strip to Kill and all the other films that she produced uh, for Roger Corman online streaming. Uh, That being said, I'm so happy I picked up this Blu-ray several years ago before it went out of print. Because uh, it has a brand new HD master in 16 by 9, 1.78 uh, uh, to ratio 1 widescreen from the original IP. And it also has two audio commentaries. Not just one, but two. Uh, it has an audio commentary with director Cat Shea and star K Lenz. There is a bonus audio commentary with director Cat Shea. <clears throat> And there's uh, also on-camera interviews with Cat Shea and Roger Corman. And I made sure to re-watch all of these bonus features in preparation. <clears throat> uh, I, I made sure to watch all these bonus features in preparation for this, uh, for this episode. And I, I tell you, it, it is wonderful uh, hearing them speak about the making of this movie. And, you know, here again, I wouldn't call it a uh, a classic of the 80s in any traditional sense. I mean, you know, here again, it, it's a genre film. It had a certain audience. It had certain requisites. And But here again, Cat Shea delivers a film. I mean, the, the strip club sequences are actually very, very impressive. I mean, uh, this was one of the first time we actually saw, you know, women, you know, dance on the pole. And, 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 and like I said, they would actually go out to actual strip clubs and study these acts. And they, and they gave, and, and of course there are real strippers in the movie, and they basically gave them the freedom to do like their, you know, their fantasy act. Like one is on a motorcycle, you know, it's just, you know, there is a lot of creativity despite the fact that we're in what is, you know, typically a sleazy type of joint, which is, you know, which is strip clubs. I mean, I went to strip clubs when I was in the military, but would I go to one now? Ne- uh, never in a million years. But, uh, I mean, here again, if I want to actually go to a strip club, I'll just watch Strip to Kill. I'll just watch Strip to Kill, you know? I mean, why not? And um, now, Strip to Kill 
actually did well enough to warrant a sequel, which is also available online. Now, Strip to Kill 2 is not nearly as good. And part of the reason for that is because um, they were given a very, very limited amount of time to actually shoot the sequel. Essentially, Roger Corman had, um, and this is very typical of Roger Corman's stories when it comes to films being made. Uh, he had a strip club set for a couple more days. So he went back to Andy Rubin and Cat Shea and basically asked him, look, can you do a sequel to Strip to Kill using this strip club set, which I only have for a few more days? So they shot some strip club footage, and then they basically wrote the story, and then they uh, filmed it from there. And I will say that Strip to Kill 2, while it's not nearly in the same class as its, um, as its uh, predecessor, it does boast uh, some interesting neo-noir elements. The twist involving the killer is not nearly as interesting or intriguing. Uh, you know, and, and there's a lot of weird stuff in Strip to Kill 2. But what it does boast is excellent photography from a cinematographer by the name of uh, Feedin' Pop, uh, uh, Papa Michael. And, uh, you know, he had started out with Cat Shea on these films, including several others we'll talk about. And uh, he has been twice nominated for the Academy Award and the BAFTA Award for Best Cinematography. And, uh, and uh, for uh, director Cat Shea, he not only shot Strip to Kill 2 live girls, but he also shot um, her, her next few films, which also include uh, Dance of the Damned, which is a vampire story, as well as uh, Streets in 1990 and Poison Ivy in 1992. Now, Dance of the Damned, while... It does have stripping sequences. I mean, here again, you know, Strip to Kill 2 and Dance of the Dam came out the same year. And I think, if I remember correctly, she said that, uh, Kat Shea said that she did Strip to Kill after Dance of the Dam. But Dance of the Dam wasn't released until after Strip to Kill 2. Now, Dance of the Damned, I think, is probably one of the most... Uh, original vampire stories I ever watched. Now, I'm not the biggest connoisseur of vampire films. I mean, you know, look, The Lost Boys, I mean, I, I know people love that film, and I can definitely see why. You know, great ensemble, great soundtrack. Um, but then again, I mean, vampire stories have just never been my thing. I mean, you know, with all due respect to, like, uh, Near Dark, uh, which was directed by uh, Catherine Bigelow. Yes, Catherine Bigelow. Near Dark came out the same year as The Lost Boys. <clears throat> uh, but Dance of the Damned is very interesting. It's basically about a vampire that happens to go into a strip club because he, he's looking for his next victim to feast on in terms of their blood and everything. And... Um, discovers that there is a, a stripper working there who is uh, going through a, a very hard time in her life. You know, she can't talk to her son because of um, restraining orders and that kind of thing. She desperately tries to reach her son on the phone, on a pay phone. And she basically has suicidal inclination. She wants to end her life because she feels that She's hit rock bottom. Now, the strip club is not named rock bottom, but <laughs> but yeah, I mean, she's, um, you know, she's in a really, really bad way and she just kind of wants to end it all. And this vampire actually looks at her as like the ideal victim because, uh, you know, he figures, well, she wants to die anyway. Why not? Why not help her out? But he wants to know. He also, you know, he he's a loner. You know, he's, you know, you know, he's a loner. He stays in his house all the time, especially during the day for obvious reasons. And 
you know, he wants to find out what it means to be human and what it means to actually experience the daylight. Because the, the interesting thing is that, I mean, you know, a stripper and a vampire, they both work at night. If you really think about it, they, they, you know, they both work at night and they develop a very, very solid, not romantic necessarily, but they develop a very, very strong and solid bond with each other. And this movie, it goes in, it goes places that you wouldn't expect for, for this type of, for, 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 for a typical vampire story. And, and that's what I really, really like about it. Uh, and, you know, I, I think the ending is certainly memorable. The vampire is given a monologue in the middle of the movie, which I think is very, very effective. And, and here again, uh, you know, both the actors who play the vampire and the stripper, you know, they're both terrific. I mean, I fell in, I, I think that they're both great. Now, granted, the vampire has this very, very, uh, huge 80s mullet, which I'm sure some will appreciate and some might snicker at. But look, they are both genuinely good in these performances. And I think Cat Shea and Andy Rubin managed to tell a vampire story that I would even recommend, even if you're not into vampires. I mean, I do think it's actually that good and easily one of the most underrated vampire movies I've ever seen. I really, really like Dance of the Damned, and I think it's one of Cat Shea's best films. In fact, I mean, it may very well be the best film that she did for Roger Corman. Her next film is kind of a tie in that arena. But, uh, yeah, I, I really, really like Dance of the Damned. Now, this Blu-ray is also out of print. This came from Scream Factory. And um, it doesn't have any bonus material, but the thing that stands out as far as this Blu-ray is concerned, because I picked this up last year, and even though it doesn't have bonus material, it actually showcases Dance of the Damned in HD. I mean, before that, I mean, I remember I saw the VHS copy of it, and it was rough. It was very, very rough when I initially saw Dance of the Damned, but it looks very, very clean in HD. Very, very clean. And I'm so glad I picked up this Blu-ray. Uh, the only downside to the Blu-ray is that you uh, get another film, which as, as you can see there on the left, called Dance with Death. Now, Dance with Death also came from the Corman Co uh, Concord factory. And regrettably, it's actually a remake of Strip to Kill, believe it or not. Uh, and Roger Corman had actually done the same thing with Dance of the Damned in the early 90s, where he basically um, uh, basically brought a new team on board to remake both of those films. Strip to Kill was remade as Dance with Death, and Dance of the Damned was remade as To Sleep with a Vampire. Well, look, needless to say, needless to say, the Cat Shea films are vastly, vastly superior. I mean, Dance with Death, I almost, almost wanted to watch that in the sense that, okay, Maxwell Caulfield from Grease 2, maybe I can have a little bit of fun with this, but no, 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 no. Strip to, uh, Strip to Kill is Citizen Kane, needless to say, when you compare it to uh, Dance with Death. And, and, and that's certainly the same case with Dance of the Damned when it comes to, to, uh, to Sleep with a Vampire. But um, Cat Shea's very last film for Roger Corman's Concord Company was actually a really, really good uh, drama called Streets, uh, which has Christina Applegate in her film debut. And um, it, she plays a runaway teenage girl who lives in the Venice section of, uh, of L.A., you know, she's homeless. Uh, she works as a prostitute. I think she's like 16 in the movie, something like that. And this was back when Christina Applegate had already done three seasons of uh, the sitcom Married with Children. And so this was actually, I think, a, a shocking role 
uh, to many of her fans at the time before she did, you know, things like um, uh, Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead, which I also have a copy of on DVD. Uh, we need a Blu-ray of that. We need a Blu-ray of Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead, now that I think about it. But Streets is very good. And the other aspect of Streets, aside from the fact it's also shot by uh, Feed and Papa Michael, and uh, it also has uh, actors that you recognize from Shay's other films. Uh, the uh, the horrific aspect of it is that there's a psychotic cop who is going around and basically killing, murdering juvenile runaways. And of course, um, Christina Applegate is his latest target. And uh, so it's it's really really good. It's available on YouTube for free. Thank goodness. There was a DVD that was put out a while ago as another double feature thing. Long out of print. It's not even available on eBay anymore, sadly. Although it's frustrating because I wish instead of Dance with Death, they would have put Streets on there or even Strip to Kill 2. I think the, 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 either of those would have been a lot more adequate than, than just putting da uh, Dance with Death on there. Um, but, I mean, yeah, Streets and... Um, Strip to Kill and Dance of the Damned, you know, there are all these uh, very, very interesting films that Cat Shea made for Roger Corman. Strip to Kill 2, it's okay. Uh, there, there's one particular sequence in an alley I really like. Um, but yeah, it's not near in the same league as, as the other films. Now, after, uh, so Streets was uh, Cat Shea's last film for Roger Corman. And then she made a movie called Poison Ivy, uh, which was her first uh, real on a huge studio film. It was released by New Line Cinema in uh, 1992. And it was also the first Cat Shea film I ever saw. I saw it way back, way back in 1993. I had completely forgotten about it. As a matter of fact, it wasn't until I rewatched it just recently that I realized I had seen it. And, the, and what triggered my memory was uh, the scene out in the rain when Tom Skerritt, uh, you know, basically makes love to Drew Barrymore, who in the movie and in real life is actually <clears throat> uh, 16 years old. But uh, so a, a Poison Ivy, it's basically an erotic thriller, you know, but it does here again, like Strip to Kill, you know, it is definitely a cut above. This is not like any of those like direct to video, uh, those, those horrible direct to video movies that came way back out in the early uh, 90s that wanted to ape off of like body heat and fatal attraction, you know, those kind of things. Uh, Poison Ivy has a little bit more substance to it. And it, it, when it focuses on, uh, when it focuses on the relationship between Drew Barrymore and um, and her uh, best friend, played by Sarah Gilbert, who was in the sitcom Roseanne at the time. When it focuses on that uh, in the movie, it's actually really, really good. Now, the thing is, you know, Drew Barrymore plays this, uh, you know, plays this, you know, this girl who, you know, she has a fake tattoo of poison ivy, you know, on her leg and. You know, she squirms her way into this wealthy family uh, where the mother, you know, she's, you know, she's, she's in bed and she's very, very ill, uh, played by, uh, played by uh, Cheryl Ladd, one of uh, the Charlie's Angels, who I'm also a, very much a fan of Cheryl Ladd, uh, particularly from a 1984 film called Purple Hearts, if you haven't checked that out yet. But, um, and the father is played by Tom Skerritt. Now, Rewatching Poison Ivy, I will say that okay, there is a Blu-ray of po of the Poison Ivy collection that came from Screen Factory, and I never bought it because of the fact that I did not want to get the other films, which were direct to video, by the way, that are in the Poison Ivy collection. You know, Alyssa Milano was in one of them. Uh, the thing is, is that I what I ended up doing was actually renting the Blu-ray. I had to because there is actually a commentary on there uh, with Cat Shea and filmmaker Courtney C. Joyner. It's actually a great commentary. It's actually a very great commentary. I mean, Cat Shea 
you know, she provides a lot of information about making the movie, which she said was based on a true story and everything. And ironically, it's when she mentioned that it was based on a true story that I realized I never want to see it again. The thing is, while there is style all over the place, uh, particularly in terms of the cinematography, the cinematography here again, uh, feed in Papa Michael. I mean, it's a it's a very beautifully mounted movie, especially for a um, an erotic thriller that you know eventually devolves into you know a, a dirty a dirty dad who basically seduces slash molests a sixteen year old woman. Look. I, I love Drew Barrymore. I am a total Drew, Drew Barrymore fan. You know, I have Ever After on Blu-ray. She eventually directed a movie called Whip It, which is awesome. You know, I, you know, I'm more prone to watching, you know, movies like Never Been Kissed or something like that. Poison Ivy, I do not want to see this movie again simply because I don't need to see Tom Skerritt coming on to Drew Barrymore anymore. Here again, the scenes with Sarah Gilbert and Drew Barrymore very, very good. Very good. And the performances are good across the board. This is not a story I need to wa- to sit and watch through again. Uh, d- despite the fact that... The, and look, I'll be honest. If Shout Factory had put out a single Blu-ray of it, I probably would have picked it up just for the commentary. But because of the fact that it's part of a collection with the other sequels, you know, in the series, which, by the way, Kat Shea admits on the commentary that she never watched them. Uh, the thing is, is that it's not really worth picking up. I mean, unless you are a Kat Shea completist or even a Drew Barrymore completist, it's not really worth picking up. I mean, I had to rent the Blu-ray just to listen to the commentary, and it's a great commentary. And yet at the same time, I mean, it's not, I don't think it's worth the $50 price tag to pick it up. I mean, here again, if only Screen Factory had put it out single Blu-rays of Poison Ivy, I probably would have picked it up. But as it stands, and I know that Kat Shea is very, very proud of the movie, and, 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 she, and she should be. She should be very proud of it. I mean, it was definitely a chance to for her to exercise her skills for a major studio, and it from what I understand, it did well on video. It, it was not really a box office success, but it did well on video. And, uh, you know, here again, I mean, there's just no reason for me to return it, even though there are there are positive aspects about it. And I can watch it as a guilty pleasure, you know, at best. I can watch it as a guilty pleasure at best. But at any rate, so that was 1992's Poison Ivy. Now, it wouldn't be for another seven years when Kat Shea would again deliver another film, this time for MGM. And it happened to be a sequel uh, called The Rage Carry 2. Now that, of course, is the sequel to the original Carry, which I have a Blu-ray right here of that of the original Carry there on the left with Sissy Spacek. And there's the remake with Chloe Grace Moretz from 2013, directed by Kimberly Pierce on the right. Now, I I want to primarily just talk about The Rage Carry 2, but I also want to touch upon the other films in the franchise for the simple reason that this is the 50th anniversary of Carrie as a novel. Now, I listened to the audiobook, uh, which not only is narrated by... Uh, Sissy Spacek, and believe me, I mean, it is wonderful, wonderful to hear her do a 50th anniversary audiobook of the of the original of the novel of Carrie. It's 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 wonderful to listen to her read it. It really is. Uh, but there's also an introduction by Margaret Atwood, of all people, who actually did uh, The Handmaid's Tale. And of course, uh, I'm looking forward to that last season of The Handmaid's Tale. It's not going to come out till next year one of the best shows to come out in the last few years and it's disturbing as hell disturbing as hell and there's also an introduction by Stephen King himself on the audiobook now um it's very interesting because Carrie is a movie I watched for the first time in high school 
And at the time that I watched it, when the film opens up with that very famous uh, shower sequence in the uh, girls' locker room at this high school, and uh, Carrie, who is this uh, you know misfit that's been brought up by a very strict religious mother and everything, you know she learns almost nothing in in terms of what she has to expect as a teenager in terms of being bullied to death and mocked to death by her classmates, but also when it comes to uh, uh, her period. And when she does eventually have her period, she had never received, you know, at 17 years old, she has a period for, for the very first time. And that, of course, you know, causes this cyclone, uh, this, 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 <laughs> this um, virtual hazing cyclone by the rest of the, uh, the girls in the locker room until the uh, gym teacher has to come out and, and set everything straight. She sends Carrie home. And what we find out about Carrie is that she apparently harbors telekinesis, you know, the power to move things uh, with your mind and all that. Now, uh, the novel is interesting because it's actually presented as a series of uh, uh, essentially flashbacks and uh, interviews uh, where we learn exactly what happened to Carrie from uh, from the moment that she has this, has this uh, shower episode and having her first period, all the way to the prom, where you know, as many people know, she ends up using her telekinesis to get revenge against the entire student body at Bates High School. Yes, uh, uh, Brian De Palma, who of course you know honors you know honors Hitchcock in many of his films. Dressed to Kill is very much a variation of Psycho, and Carrie with Bates a, a High School. You know, obviously that's a nod to Norman Bates and the Psycho franchise. And look, I, the first Carrie, I have to admit, even though Brian De Palma's film is considered a classic, and Rightly so, I will not, I, I have no objection whatsoever to Carrie's status as a classic. When I saw it in high school, admittedly, it didn't scare me. I found it disturbing uh, because of certain aspects, because of the bullying and everything. For some reason, I wasn't as shocked as I think I probably should have been. I mean, granted, I wasn't around in 1976 when the movie came out, and I didn't see it until years later. And I kind of already knew what was going to happen. So, you know, sort of like with Nightmare on Elm Street, you know, you already kind of know what's what's up and coming. So you're not really, you're not really for in for any surprises here. But look, CeCe Spacek and her mother, played by Piper Laurie, they are so good that they make the movie worth watching and even worth owning just for their terrific Oscar nominated performances. I mean, they are, I mean, they are remembered largely for doing carry together and, and it's got a solid supporting cast too. I mean, John Travolta is a real, a, a real moron who treats, uh, you know, his girlfriend like crap. Uh, Chris Hargison played by, uh, Nancy Allen, and then there's uh, Sue Snell, who is the one that actually wants to help Carrie and basically recruits her boyfriend to ask Carrie to the prom. But meanwhile, there's this other girl who feels that she was punished, at, you know, and she and um, she uh, loses her uh, ability to go to the prom and everything, and she blames it all on Carrie, even though she kind of instigated what happened in the shower. And it was the gym teacher who ultimately took away uh, uh, her ability to go to the prom, which back in the 70s, uh, that was like probably like the worst thing in the world is if you were being denied your prom tickets and everything. Uh, I'm not sure nowadays if that is uh, still a thing necessarily. And, that, and that's the thing. Look, are there dated aspects about Carrie from 76? Of course. Uh, I mean, at the time, I, I can imagine that people were very, very impressed with Brian De Palma's uh, use of split screen and and uh, other uh, techniques at the time, which were considered novel. Uh, the Pino Dinaggio score is, for the most part, very good. Although there's one, although although there's one moment in the film where it comes off very uh, uh, campy and disco-y. I mean, it's hard to describe, 
but I'm just like, wait a minute, this portion of the score sounds nothing like the rest of the score. Uh, and, and the ending has never really worked for me either, even though I'm sure it shocked audiences at the time. I mean, I knew what was going to happen. I will say that. And, but look, the revenge sequence at the prom is memorable as hell. Uh, I mean, when she gets the pig blood dumped on her, even though don't think about it too much, don't think about it too much. Cause you know, it's, it's due to some rather extraordinary circumstances that she actually ends up on that prom stage as the prom queen uh, <laughs> with Sue Snell's boyfriend and everything. Uh, but here again, watching the Brian De Palma film again after all these years, I have to admit it holds up. Uh, it, it may not be perfect, but it definitely holds up, and I fully submit to its classic status. It's fully, fully earned. And of the four films in the Carrie franchise, it's easily the best one. It's, I mean, there's just, you know, and... That brings us to the sequels. Now, it took us over 20 years before we actually got another Carrie movie, and that, of course, was the Rage Carrie 2. As a matter of fact, I think they were on the verge of not making the film at all. Uh, uh, you, know, you know, it was one of those touch-and-go things, like, eh, it, you know, has it been too long? You know, that kind of thing. And uh, Cat Shea was brought on board to direct the Rage Carrie 2. At the time, I passed on it. Now, I don't remember if that was just due to the fact that I had a less than enthusiastic, uh, enthusiastic response to the original, which, of course, has now been uh, reversed. Watching Rage Carry 2, I was actually surprised I kind of liked it. It does sort of repeats some of the beats of the original, but at the same time, it goes on its own path. I mean, unlike the remake from 2013, as well as the TV version, which came out in 2002, it actually, the Rage Carry 2 does not end at the prom. It actually ends at a, uh, a house party. And here again, I mean, it has, um, you know, the uh, star of the movie, who is, uh, who is really good, by the way, played by Emily Burgle, uh, she plays uh, Rachel. Yeah, she plays Rachel, who's this, uh, you know, this goth teenage girl. And, uh, you know, one of the uh, one of the football players notices her. You know, it's it is different from the original Carrie in that the, you know, the football player is basically pushed into asking Carrie out. But in this movie, uh, the football player actually develops genuine feelings uh, for uh, the girl in question. There are several connections to the original Carrie, which, um, I, I, I mean, I don't think that they're necessarily, I mean, from what I understand, this project when it was written is that it was not written as a Carrie sequel, but it was written as its own thing. And the writer of this film is also the writer that I, I believe wrote Hackers uh, for MGM and everything. And Rewatching Rage Carry 2, I was actually very surprised on how much I liked it. I mean, it's got uh, Jason London, uh, who I've liked in other films like Days Confused and um, um, uh, The Man in the Moon, you know, Reese Witherspoon's very first film. I mean, I like the cast. I like the fact that they bring Sue Snell back, um, even though the thing is, is that now the connection that the lead character has to the original char character carry character is a bit of a stretch it's a bit of a stretch it's a it's a little hard to swallow and yet at the same time i like the differences because of that little twist where i do think it separates itself from the original and cache here again takes the opportunity to honor brian de palma with uh with Rage Carry 2. And it just, it surprisingly works for me. I'm actually very surprised I liked uh, the Rage as much as I did. I especially like the, uh, the the climactic party sequence where she finally does get, get revenge against the um, football players and everybody else that uh, mocked her. The toxic masculinity in Rage Carry 2 is off the charts. And in fact, years later during the Me Too movement, 
that was uh, cited by uh, uh, critics later, and it actually had a more favorable reception. I mean, it bombed at the box office. The critics hated Rage Carry 2. They loathed the movie. It's not bad. It's not bad. And I, you know, here again, I actually think it's the second best film in the Carry franchise. Now, here again, unfortunately, this Blu ray from Screen Factory is out of print. Uh, but you get both the 2002 TV movie and Rage Carry 2. And there is a, a, an audio commentary with director Cat Shea, which is great. Uh, there's an alternate ending with before and after special effects sequence and also some additional scenes not seen in the theater when this came out in 1999. So, and the, the television version is okay. It sort of goes along with some other t uh, television adaptations from Stephen King books like, uh, like uh, The Shining and that kind of thing. And it's okay. It's watchable. The twist at the end of the TV movie is that she actually survives, which that was one of my issues with the original Carrie is that, look, she goes through so much shit in school and so much shit at home. I wanted her to live, damn it. I wanted to her to live and actually, you know, dispatch her mother, uh, you know, after she dispatches all the students and dispatches the mother, that she actually escapes and starts a new life. Which, of course, being a tragedy, that's that wasn't going to happen. Uh, but I still like the idea of that. And they actually try to do that in the 2002 version, which, here again, to give credit where credit is due, they try to be more faithful to the book with the television version. Uh, it's way too long. I mean, you know, by the time we get to the part where uh, John, uh, Billy Nolan and Chris Hargison actually go get the pig's blood. You know, we're, we're barely even halfway through the movie and we still have a whole nother hour to get through. And, you know, there's all these long sequences of the, of the, uh, the interviews that, you know, in the aftermath and everything. And quite frankly, it's a bit too much for this story. And it's not nearly as compelling as the Brian De Palma film, not even close. Now the remake for what it is, I thought it was okay. I think the Kimberly Pierce remake is okay. I mean, granted, I want the, wanted the Kimberly Pierce of uh, Boys Don't Cry. See, that's the funny thing. When Rage Car uh, Rage Two, uh, when the Rage Carry Two came out in 1999, uh, Kimberly Pierce made her debut with a movie called Boys Don't Cry, which ended up uh, winning uh, Hilary Swank the Best Actress Oscar. Um, you know. Uh, Exactly. So, I mean, and the remake for what it is, it's okay. There are elements about it I like, and there are elements that sort of highlight, you know, how I think pointless it was to do this, uh, to do this remake. There are a few things I do like about it. I mean, I do like some of the revenge stuff better in terms of the uh, telekinesis. Uh, Julian Moore, very, very uh, subdued and subtle compared to uh, Piper Laurie's version in the original. Uh, and I, I liked Chloe Grace Moretz, uh, especially when I saw her in other films like Kick-Ass and Let Me In and everything. I mean, she's very good as Carrie as well. I, I don't think that there's necessarily a bad Carrie movie in the franchise, but I do think that Rage Carrie 2 does have uh, the benefit above the remake and the television version just because it does go in different directions and doesn't rely on the original film, even though there are flashbacks, which I think were, uh, which were, I think, almost extraneous. I mean, you know, you took out some of those flashbacks and it could be like a 98 minute movie like the original. It goes out to about 105 minutes. There's a great Cat Shea cameo uh, in the middle of the movie as well. And look, I mean, if you've never seen Rage Carry 2, give it a shot. I mean that. G give it a shot. Uh, I would say give it a shot, especially over the television version and the Kimberly Pierce version, even though both of those versions had their merits and everything. So, um, yeah, that is uh, basically almost all of Cat Shea's movies. Now, I wanted to mention just real, real quick. Uh, even though that she has directed since Rage Carry 2, I mean, she has, uh, you know, an acting school now in, uh, in L.A. And, the, and she's, and, you know, she became an acting teacher. And, you know, she 
you know, um, you know, served as a coach for many young actresses coming, uh, coming in, uh, uh, coming up in Hollywood and everything, which is wonderful. Uh, she did a television movie called Sharing the Secret with Allison Lohman and uh, Diane Ladd uh, and uh, Tim Matheson and Mary Winningham, which is a very good look at uh, bulimia. It actually won a, a Peabody Award for, quote, an impressive, moving, and candid portrait of a teenager in crisis. Very, very, very good TV movie directed by Kat Shea. Now, but the reason why I watched all these films in the first place, and that's what I'm saying, is that I can't, I can't end this episode of 60 Minutes of Stone without um, confessing that I am a fan, and I'm not ashamed to admit it, I am very much a fan of Nancy Drew. I grew up reading the Nancy Drew mystery stories, and it is because of Cat Shea's version of Nancy Drew and the Hidden Staircase, which is based on the second book in the original Nancy Drew mystery story series. It is because of this movie that I bought all these other movies on Blu-ray and I discovered all of Cat Shea's other films. Yes, Poison Ivy was the first one I saw. I had completely forgotten about it, but I never would have watched Strip to Kill 2, uh, one in, Strip to Kill 1 and 2, Streets, Dance of the Damned, uh, and uh, Rage if it wasn't for Nancy Drew in The Hidden Staircase. And as you can see, it stars uh, Sophie Lillis uh, from the movie It, uh, from the It movies, and it also has Sam Trammell and Linda Lavin. And it's a very, very good updated adaptation of the original story. And what I love about it, what I particularly love about this version, it brings back some of the original characters from the stories, like Bess and George uh, in her town of River Heights. And look, Nancy Drew, you know, she's a 16-year-old detective. And this is sort of like an origin story of sorts that showcases how she became a detective in the first place. You know, she, you know, her mother dies. She goes, she moves with her father, who's a lawyer, to this town called River Heights outside of Chicago. You know, she makes new friends. You know, she gets into a little bit of trouble, you know, in terms of uh, uh, getting back at, uh, uh, you know, here again, you know, getting back at toxic masculinity, you know, uh, you know, where, uh, <laughs> where one of these football players ends up with, uh, with blue ink all over him, you know, where it's almost like uh, Eileen Brennan in, in uh, Private Benjamin where, um, you know, she, where she gets back at, 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 the, at this guy and everything. And it's really good stuff. And then we have a mystery involving a haunted house and how, you know, what's going on in this house. We have no idea, but like uh, drawers move by themselves. And what we discover is that there is, in fact, a hidden staircase. Now, of course, Nancy Drew had been around since, uh, since 1930. And in fact... Uh, we actually, Warner Brothers had actually put out in the late 30s some um, hour-long B-films uh, uh, of Nancy Drew. As you can see right there, uh, Nancy Drew Detective, Nancy Drew Reporter, Troubleshooter, and there is a 1939 version of Nancy Drew and the Hidden Staircase. Um, and these films are a lot of fun. They're not exactly literary version, the, the literary version of Nancy, but Benita Granville is just a ball of fire. She was nominated for an Academy Award for this um, movie called These Three. It's a William Wyler picture, which is famous because Margaret Hamilton, who played uh, the witch in the original Wizard of Oz, um, you know, gives Benita Granville, who was 13 at the time also, smacks her across the face because her lies uh, at this uh, boarding school, you know, basically destroy the lives and careers of three adults, you know, and it just, when it finally is revealed at the end that, you know, she has been manipulative and a, a total liar throughout, you know, Margaret Ham Hamilton just whacks her across the face and it's a brilliant performance where she, where she was nominated for an academy award for best supporting actress at 13 years old and she played 
Nancy Drew in this series of films for Warner Brothers in the 1930s. There was also a television series in the 1970s, uh, the, uh, which also included the Hardy Boys and everything. Uh, I mean, I, I didn't love it, but I mean, it's we're seeing for a lot of the cameos and the up and up and coming actors. I mean, in one episode, we have Robert England, who, of course, later played Freddy Krueger and Jamie Lee Curtis in the same episode playing bikers, you know. So, I mean, like I said, that 70s uh, series has its uh, has uh, interesting elements to it. And then, of course, we had a 2007 movie, uh, which while it sort of honored Nancy Drew in terms of the 75th anniversary and everything, Emma, Emma Roberts played Nancy. Um, it's, it, it's my least favorite of all the Nancy Drew films. I mean, comparably speaking to the four films from the thirties and Cat Shay's movie from uh, 2019, it, do, it just doesn't quite measure up, even though there are, here again, I mean, there are, are there are good things about that movie, but uh, you know, uh, to me, Cat Shay finally got Nancy Drew right. But the sad thing is, I mean, I saw Nancy Drew in Hidden Staircase. I saw it in the theater. It had a seventeen million dollar budget, which ironically it was the exact same amount that Rage Two, uh, Rage Carry Two made on a twenty one million dollar budget. Uh, but Nancy Drew and the Hidden Staircase, it didn't even make a million dollars. It was released in limited release for some odd reason. And I wanted another Nancy Drew movie with Sophie Lillis and the other actors in it who play uh, Bess and George. I wanted another Nancy Drew movie with these actors so badly. And it never happened. I mean, of course, when you're when you're um, making movies with actors this you know this young, you know you can only get them for certain times of the day. They have to go to school and everything. And I figured, well, you know, they better make another movie quickly, otherwise they're they're going to age out of all these roles. And of course, it's been five years, and now I wonder, as a Nancy Drew fan, if we will ever see Nancy Drew on the screen ever again. I mean, is the IP dead? I certainly hope not. And that's the thing that there, there's no commentary on this Blu-ray, but uh, there is a nice little featurette. There is a nice little featurette, as you can see right there. There's a gag reel, and uh, the featurette is a sleuth, a girl, and an inspiration. And then there's also a featurette uh, touring Twin Elms called uh, Pink Fo uh, Footprints. And uh, like I said, you know, it has interviews with Cat Shea and Sophie Lewis and uh, some of the other people that made the movie. And, you know, they all come off like they can't that they really approach this Nancy Drew movie with a uh, great passion and reverence for the character, as well as the original mystery stories. And even though this movie, like the uh, 1930s movies, even though the emphasis is a bit more on comedy than it is on mystery they're still delightful films. Um, and I encourage you, even if you're not a Nancy Drew film, check them out, especially if you like to catch any of Cat Shay's uh, earlier films. So, and then uh, she also made a movie for Netflix recently called uh, Rescued by Ruby, uh, starring Scott Wolf, which uh, actually had a, had a, a a very high, I mean, it was 100% Rotten Tomatoes based on five reviews. And on the week of 21st to 28th of March, the film had 311 million viewing minutes, ranking fourth on Nielsen's top movie chart of that week and Netflix's top English language films. It plays second. So look, I mean, you know, even though it is very sad that Nancy Drew and the Hidden Staircase didn't really find an audience. I mean, I fell in love with it when I first saw it. I think it's an absolute delight to watch. I love Sophie Lewis as Nancy Drew. And it's just an absolute shame that we didn't have another Nancy Drew movie with these same actors. It's um, it's a loss. And, uh, and, and here again, that's why I wonder if we will ever see a Nancy Drew, Drew movie ever again. But... Um, but that's about it. That is my uh, that is my overview of Cat Shay's cinema. Uh, once again, Roger Corman, rest in peace. And uh, please be sure to check out all of all of these Cat Shay films 
that I talked about. Strip to, uh, strip to Kill, uh, Dance of the Damned. Uh, ignore the other one on here. Just watch Dance of the Damned. <laughs> uh, the, the Rage Carry 2. And Poison Ivy is watchable, but, you know, here again, I, I just don't think it's worth buying. Unless Shout Factory actually puts out a single Blu-ray with the commentary, or if another overseas company does it. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the, the, uh, the Nancy Drew movies that I just talked about. But also, if you are a Cat Shea fan, pick up the Psycho 3 Blu-ray, where she does have that interview. And, and like I said, the special makeup effects artist Michael Westmore later went over to help Cat Shea make Strip to Kill. So um, that's, that's it. I highly recommend all those films for you to check out. Thank you uh, very much uh, for joining me uh, for episode three of 60 Minutes of Stone. And uh, we will see you again next month. I, I am now, I think I'm pretty certain that I want to do for episode four. What I want to do for episode four of 60 Minutes of Stone is uh, basically two things. Uh, Psycho 4, the beginning, I figured, well, if I talked about Psycho 2 for my last episode, I talked about Psycho 3 for this episode, might as well talk about Psycho 4, the beginning for the next episode. But I will also be talking about the television series Bates Motel, which, as you can see right up there, uh, I am very, very excited to talk about Bates Motel and Psycho 4, the beginning, which both uh, look at... Norman Bates, as well as his mother, uh, Norma, played in Psycho uh, 4 by Olivia, uh, Olivia Hussey, and play, played in Bates Motel by, uh, I need, uh, Vera Farmiga. Vera Farmiga, yes, the lovely, lovely, beautiful Vera Farmiga. And, of course, Freddie Highmore plays... Um, uh, uh, Norman Bates. But uh, last but not least, before I close this out, last but not least, there's also another connection to Bates Motel because uh, Max Thero, who played Nancy Drew's boyfriend Ned Nickerson in the 2007 movie, he's also in Bates Motel. So uh, I, I very much look looking forward to do that uh, episode four of uh, 60 Minutes of Stone for Bates Motel and Psycho 4. Uh, thank you very much for joining me. The Visited by Voices Network is a consortium of content creators who explore genre art. Our collective aim is to jumpstart conversations in the horror community by providing unique viewpoints. We come to film and books with all the baggage and experiences from our everyday lives. And this allows us to see works through our own independent light prisms. At VBV Network, we reject groupthink, consensus, and social standards in regards to what makes narrative arts work. You may not often agree with us, but there'll always be a respectful place for you to add your opinion to the mix. Oh.